So my name is Jessica Mott, and I am a graduate student in um, David Mobley's lab. Today I am going to be talking about training data set selection. So um, the training data set selection is for the open force field version 1.2, small molecule force field, um, also known as Parsley. So prior to 1.2, we were using generation one training data set. And today I will be focusing on our newly designed generation two training data set. So how does the training data set fall into the general workflow for um, open force field? So our training data is quantum mechanical torsion drives, optimizations, and hessians. Um, the data sets are created and located in QC archive. So we use this training data in our fitting, fitting procedure. Um, we use force balance. So here's the general workflow of force balance. And where the training data comes into play is for the reference ab initio calculations. So using our training data, we can generate um, newly fit force fields such as Smirnoff version 1.2. So today I'm going to be focusing on how we redesigned our training data. The aim of the new data set is to improve the generalizability of our force field. So we wanted to look at how can we curate our training data set to create a force field that is able to model a larger range of chemistries. We had three major aims when creating um, the generation two training data set. The first aim was that all of our parameters were used um, in the force field or had any coverage. Second, we wanted to make sure all of our parameters were used a reasonable amount of times. So we considered five times reasonable coverage. And then we also wanted to um, make sure that our parameters were used in diverse chemical environments. So our approach to this was we developed this general workflow, which I will be going into more detail during this presentation. So to start off, um, stage one, our starting data sets. So the main improvement for Gen 2 compared to Gen 1 is that we expanded the amount of data that we were selecting molecules from. So in Gen 1, um, we used only the Roche set and the coverage set. Um, but in Gen 2, we expanded to um, three additional data sets. So the E molecules discrepancy data set. Um, all of these data sets, um, their generation is uh, explained in, um, on GitHub, but I will, I will mention later where you can find everything. So the E-Molecules discrepancy data set was created um, by Jordan Ehrman in our lab, and it's uh, measured, it was created based off the differences of um, RMSD of different molecules using different force fields, and the molecules where Smirnoff performed the most different were placed into this data set. We also added the Pfizer discrepancy set, um, which selected molecules that performed differently for QM versus OPLS3. And then we've also added the Bayer data set, um, which consists of a patented collection of pharmaceutically relevant molecules. So next, we parse the inputs and determine parameter usage. So the way we did this was we took each molecule from the data set and we labeled each molecule in the data set with the bond um, angle and torsion parameter that each molecule use. And then we expanded the tautomeric and isomeric state. Um, so we had 
each molecule that utilized each parameter in each data set um, separated. From there, we were able to do um, fingerprinting and clustering, which is how we um, generated more diverse data sets. So um, when we found the fingerprints, um, Hesu, who also worked on this, did excellent experiments to determine what type of fingerprint method we, we wanted to use for our analysis. So what Hesu did was took a limited set of molecules and she explored tree fingerprints, path fingerprints, lingo fingerprints, and max key fingerprints. Um, and then she found the distance matrix for this limited set of molecules. And then um, from there, we were able to find that the tree and path fingerprints were very sensitive to stereochemistry. And overall, we found that the max key fingerprint was um, the best fingerprint to use for our case because it focused most greatly on functional group matches. And this supported our, um, our goal to increase the chemical diversity of our training data set. Um, from there, with the fingerprints, the max key fingerprints, we were able to use dbscan to cluster all of the different fingerprints. After that, um, we performed molecule selection. So from each of the various clusters, we selected um, randomly a molecule from each cluster under the assumption that the molecule was representative of a unique chemistry within that cluster. Um, we then generated QM data in QC archive. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, resulting coverage data and exploring the diversity of the different data sets. So um, this is results from Heisu, who generated the torsion data sets. So in her first round of selections, she selected one torsion per parameter randomly. She was able to get pretty good coverage. Um, and then in the second round, she selected one torsion per cluster. Um, so this means that each parameter could have more than one torsion. And overall, we did have a lot of new calculations submitted to QC Archive for our um, Gen 2 training data set. So now to talk more about the optimization data set, which is what I primarily focused on working on, is um, so I found that the coverage is improved greatly for the Generation 2 optimization data set. So in these two bar plots along the x-axis, we have the different angle and the bond parameters, and then we have number of molecules along the y-axis, and the blue um, is generation one, which is overlapped by gen two training data set in orange. So as you can see, there is improved um, coverage in gen two pretty much across the board for Gen 2 compared to Gen 1. So we have many more molecules um, utilizing the parameters. And there's also an increased coverage for bonded parameters. Um, B44 and B41 are now covered by Gen 2 data set and were not covered in Gen 1. So um, looking at the distribution of uh, heavy atoms for the generation one and generation two data sets, we can see that gen two optimization data set covers a much larger distribution of molecule sizes, which is really great for um, improving chemical diversity. So in gen one data set, um, the heavy atoms was mostly between 10 and 15, but in gen two, we were able to get coverage of molecules almost up to 40 heavy atoms. This allows for a lot more intermixing of different chemistries for our fitting. And then I performed another test that looked at um, 
functional groups. So what I found was Gen 2 training data set covers a broader range of functional groups, which is also very great. Um, so um, how I performed these tests was I took 200 pharma pharmaceutically relevant functional groups and um, performed analysis to see um, which chemistry was being utilized in Gen 1 and Gen 2 data set. So these plots are a little bit difficult to see just due to the size, but um, the nodes in the data set represent the different functional groups and the edges represent the uses of the actual functional groups. So what was really great to see was Gen 2 data set covered an additional 22 functional groups in this test compared to Gen 1. Um, Gen 2 had 120 nodes and Gen 1 had 98 nodes. And then really interestingly, Gen 2 data set had many, many more edges. So this shows that there's a lot more intermixing of these different functional groups in um, the data set. There was 19,000 edges in Gen 2 and Gen 1 had 8,000 edges. So these, these training data sets are available to everyone. Um, so there's six torsion drive data sets and five optimization data sets um, in QC archive. These, in, in the table, we have the names of all of the torsion data sets and the optimiz optimization data sets. Also, all of the generation scripts and, um, are detailed on QC you see data set submission under the open force field repository. So um, some future directions for training data set selection is we could consider increasing the number of data sets selected from. This would surely increase diversity. Um, we can also look into benchmarking of, of the data sets. Um, to determine if we were achieving our goal of generalizability. Um, also, it'd be really interesting to look at automated approaches to force field fitting and benchmarking so we could perform more efficient experiments on train da training data set selection to inform us better um, on how we can improve the method. And then lastly, it would be interesting to curate additional data sets with diverse chemistries um, to try to improve the coverage even more. So in conclusion, I've gone over um, our training data set selection procedure for Gen 2. And then I also was able to go over the analysis of the coverage and the chemical diversity of the new training data set. So with that, I wanna thank Hesu for um, working with me on this project. She did a lot of really great research. Um, and I also want to thank Li Ping, um, my PI, David Mobley, and Chris Bailey for all of their help and scientific input on this project. And I want to thank Jeff Wagner, Daniel Smith, and Ben Pritchard for really helping with getting these data sets completed in QC Archive. And Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jessica? I have a question and a, and a comment. Um, what, what, what is the significance of naming a data set a, a discrepancy data set? What are, I don't know if that's that does that mean. Oh, that's my fault. Um, I can answer that one. So we had a separate project done by um, an undergrad in the group named Jordan Ehrman, who was, he was taking all of E molecules and energy minimizing it with a variety of different force fields. And then looking for molecules where the geometries were dramatically different across force fields. Okay. So the idea being that like uh, those are informative molecules and also happens that some of that chemistry is like really weird and or sort of unusual or pretty has a lot of diverse functional groups in it. So 
we thought, you know, well, molecules that have discrepancies across force fields is probably a good place to be looking for training our force field, but then also because it uses a bunch of rare parameters, it's also really good for improving coverage. So we pulled in some of those compounds and, and so it happens that, you know, we're using some of that here because, partly because it uses a bunch of rare parameters and partly because it's informative. Thank you. Thanks. So, so clearly, you know, as you try and get these obscure molecules and you generalize more, then that will degrade the force field overall. I mean, that's expected. And well, that's the, that's the question. I don't know, maybe Jessica should go first on that one, but I can comment too. Yeah. What do you think, Jessica? So the... <laughs> The, the question is if we continue to increase the diversity of the training data set? It's, 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 a, it's obviously, yeah, the, the increasing the diversity obviously is the right thing to do to develop the generalized force field. I have no problems with that. But, uh, but of course, as we, as we move out and try and bring in more obscure molecules into, into the domain, then I would expect the, the force field will, of course, be general, uh, but it will generally degrade. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just just wondering what your thoughts were on this. And that's obvious. Uh, I believe that's expected. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think that it, it'd be interesting. I'm not. I'm not quite sure if it would necessarily degrade. Um, it, it would. It's kind of the question. I I see it as. If we add more diverse chemistries, do we know if this will, will affect all of the chemical environment of the molecule? Maybe, maybe the results will not be changed very much. Um, I don't know, David, do you have thoughts on this too? Yeah, I think it maybe partly depends on what one wants out of a general force field um, and like affects issues like the domain of applicability. So like, let's suppose we were trying to get, you know, build a really good force field for alkanes. Then, you know, the more molecules that we include that aren't alkanes, the more we have to worry about that degrading our treatment of alkanes, right? On the other hand, if we're trying to build a force field that sort of generally covers everything, then you could, you could argue that, well, the more, the better representation we have of everything in our fitting data, the more general and accurate we might expect it to be in general, though for any particular class of molecules, maybe it, maybe you could find classes where making it more general will degrade it. So, so I think what you asked is a really profound question and what one wants may vary depending on like target application and field and how general you want your force field to be. So like your answer for what you might want might be different from, you know, Pharma's answer for what you want. So that might mean that we eventually want to end up designing different training sets for the applications we have in mind. But I don't, I guess, I don't yeah. I'm not sure we know you know, the, the answer to that really in general yet. I guess if we were to start from scratch, you would, you would carry along, you would, you would also consider changes in the potential function, it's functions or the potential function. So the, the various terms and so on. And, and then, then it's probably possible to sort of get a, a really good force field. But at the moment you're kind of, you're limited to a potential function, which I assume worked on a small class of molecules really well. And now we are sticking to the same potential function and extending the applicability. So we are kind of constrained on, on one issue. And that may, well, we'll wait and see what the results are really, but may, mm -hmm. you'd think that if you bring in more obscure molecules, it's, it's likely to degrade. The, but the, the other factor that, that works it comes into play though is, you know, let's say we look at like, you know, a, a parameter that that's like a generic carbon with three connections or something. 
but we're not extending where that parameter is used. Um, that is to say, our force field applies it only in places that happen to use the generic carbon with three connections parameter. So it's never going to apply to a carbon with four connections. Um, so we're not making the four, as we bring in new molecules, we're not making the force field more general in terms of what it covers. Like if we bring in something really weird that our current parameters don't, or our typing does not cover it all, our typing is still not going to cover it. Hmm. So you could say what we're doing is we're just, you know, we have these groups of, you know, molecules that our typing can cover, and we would like to build out so that we cover all possible environments. Maybe maybe that's too broad, but a broad representation of all the environments in which that parameter could occur. And as long as it describes them well, we're fine having them all lumped together. But then if we start finding that, you know, some of these molecules are treated well and some of them are treated badly, then maybe we want to split it off into, you know, two types of carbons with three connections or, or you know, increase the sophistication with, with which we treat them. So, and that's a little bit aside from the functional form issue you raised, but just within a specific functional form, we can ask how well are we treating them. And that gets back to some of what Vicky was talking about, where she looks at um, whether specific parameters are overrepresented in compounds with higher errors. Thank you.